Okay. Um, hopefully, uh, everybody can hear me. Uh, good afternoon. Apologies for the uh, slight technical glitches at the beginning here. Uh, and welcome to uh, the second webinar in this Advanced Acceleration Technology in MRI uh, series that have been put together by uh, the MR Working Group. Uh, today, we've got a presentation about uh, GE Healthcare's uh, uh, Air Recon DL. Um, I'm Martin Graves from uh, University of Cambridge, and uh, this presentation has been put together by my colleague Ed Peak, uh, who has uh, happily, whatever, um, got on to um, uh, have a baby uh, yesterday and um, so uh, hence he's not here to uh, deliver it live, but uh, we do have a recording of him. Uh, and just to remind everybody that uh, this session is being recorded and uh, will be uploaded hopefully onto the, the website uh, and you'll be uh, adv advised of that uh, hopefully by the end of today. Um, please direct any questions that you may have to the chat. Uh, and I will do my best uh, to answer the questions um, after the uh, the presentation. So I think if everything is uh, is good to go with the office, um, here's Ed's recording, and I'll speak to you afterwards. Good afternoon, and welcome to the second webinar in IPEM's Advanced Acceleration Technology Series. Today we're going to be looking at um, AATs for GE users. My name is Ed Peake. I'm a clinical scientist working in MRI at Cambridge University Hospitals. So today I want to talk about deep learning image reconstruction, specifically GE's implementation known as Air Recon DL, and two separate facets to this. The first one is looking at resolution and Gibbs artifacts, and then also the denoising effect this um, ARDL has, before moving on to some clinical examples, looking at how it's affected our clinical services in Cambridge before uh, giving examples of how to optimize protocols um, both at DV29 and then some soft, some additional uh, 3D and propellers um, versions that are available at MR30. And then we'll look at the IPEM resource web page to try and help users out and provide some additional information. So Air Recon DL is a relatively new um, example of AI working in MRI to improve spatial resolution and denoise images. There's a white paper from Mark LaBelle available on BioArchive, and it has been for a couple of years now. And it really goes into the, the nitty gritty of how the algorithm performs without giving too much information about how it's uh, developed to try and protect some of the IP uh, that belongs to GE, whilst giving users uh, as much information as possible as to how it might behave um, in, in a clinical scenario. So very, Broadly, it's trained using pairs of images, firstly, high images with very low resolution and then synthetic low resolution images with uh, increased Gibbs ringing and noise. And then the, the, the scientists have created millions of uh, unique image augmentation pairs that they've used to train a deep learning neural network. And these neural networks are very large and they're able to learn kind of the Fourier transform to get from the low resolution back to the high resolution whilst also increasing um, that spatial resolution and denoising the image. And the users have selected three settings for the denoising, low, medium and high, to allow people to fine tune their, their implementation to either have more or less noise to keep the, the ARDL from creating an image that's very different to what clinicians are used to seeing. And this is a little example um, from uh, the paper on BioArchive that shows SNR on the vertical axis against the number of signal averages on the horizontal. And the black line at the bottom is just your standard um, square root of n curve. And then we have the low, medium and high implementations of the Air Recon DL showing increased gains in signal and two potential options for implementation. The first one is matched signal to noise where you try and keep the same signal to noise ratio, but you're able to scan much more quickly due to that, that boost in uh, denoising, or you can have um, match scan times and get much higher levels of SNR, which potentially allows you to reduce um, the resolution, getting uh, better quality images. 
So this is an example of the resolution effects on a phantom. So as you can see on the original images, the, the top two um, line uh, line spacings there are not, not very visible. Whereas on with the Air Recon DL, the um, resolution is, is vastly improved and we can see all of those line pairs. And it doesn't matter whether or not you have this on low, medium or high, because that's to do with the denoising. The resolution and reduction in Gibbs ringing is the same across those three settings. And again, we can see here um, with a coarse matrix, we have um, truncation artifacts, which we can see as a repetition of those high intensities at the, the difference at the borders between high and low signal intensity. So we can see that ripple effect going through our image. And with ARDL, um, that's substantially suppressed and the image looks much cleaner. So just to quickly recap, so Gibbs stringing occurs as a direct result of the Fourier transform which converts our acquired signal into an image and high contrast boundaries are very sharp and so they require a very large number of frequencies to represent them. But our matrix in frequency space is limited, so k space is finite and truncation errors of, in this k space can lead to a ripple effect in the image when we do our inverse Fourier transform to get back to our, our MRI after acquiring the signal. And just to show a clinical case, this is a T2 weighted image. And if you look along the midline, you can see some high intensities uh, right next to lower intensity signals. And this creates a ripple effect um, due to the, the lower spatial resolution in the phase encode direction, which in this image is left, right. And this will be substantially reduced due to the implementation of ARDL, again, at any level, low, medium or high. So to train these networks, we really need a, a different approach to just a simple mathematical operation where you go from A to B after applying uh, the inverse uh, Fourier transform. So what, what the scientists have done at GE is they've collected a large number of these high resolution images. We don't know how high, potentially 10, 24 or 512. And then they synthesize lower resolutions um, by removing phase encode and frequency encode um, lines in K space. And that's something that you could just acquire on the scanner by spending less time uh, acquiring those images at a quarter matrix. So it's nothing fancy, um, but those synthetic images are then used to train the network along with a high quality pair. And the deep neural network with all of those um, connections learns uh, an advanced version of the Fourier transform, which um, it minimizes a sort of a, an error where it tries to, to kind of guess the right solution as it goes along and get as close to, as possible to those high quality images. If you remember in K-space, the, um, the resolution of the image is proportional to that size of K-space. So if you want to go from a 256 to a 512 matrix, there's a lot of K-space that we have to interpolate. And one of the, the criticisms of, um, of AI sometimes and of neural networks is that they just make things up. And that's become more and more pertinent, especially when we look at um, you know, Twitter and, and Instagram and and we see examples, for example, here we, we've got um, stable diffusion, which is fantastic for, for normal images. And we can expand these, these brilliant um, paintings. But really, the, the algorithm is just making things up. You know, it's, it's understanding how natural images behave. And there's all sorts of choices you could have when you're expanding a, a natural image. And sometimes clinicians will kind of get this information and they'll think, well, you know, how believable or, or real is AI, especially in a, a context where you're using these images for diagnosis. And this is somewhat backed up by experts where we have people that are publishing on um, widely available um, AI solutions for accelerated imaging, showing that kind of small perturbations and errors in the base data set can create a myriad of problems and artifacts in the final images. And the take home message here would be the first thing is think very carefully about the network architecture with GE. This is a black box. They haven't told us how it's done. Um, I assume that it's done using some sort of unit or a, a set of, of units, but that's just my opinion. And then also training. So, you, you know, garbage in, garbage out. You've got to train with very high quality data and it's got to be realistic to the system that you're interpreting, that you're, you're training. And in this case, uh, fortunately, uh, the, increase in resolution and the reduction in Gibbs ringing is just achieved by continuing on this uh, this function. So here we can see the truncated signal in K space and the algorithm just needs to continue on that signal further and further into a broader K space um, matrix. And it's able to do this because we can provide it with a very large number of 
uh, training examples and it can learn the sort of the best fit for these uh, for these functions so we don't get these sharp transitions and that will vastly improve our resolution and it will also improve or reduce our Gibbs artifact. And so to gain generalizability, there's a few things the authors um, have done or have said they've done. So the first one is to train using images at multiple field strengths with different uh, anatomies. So not just training with images of heads, for example, and training with different pulse sequences. So all of the pulse sequences that are available on the scanner, hopefully have gone into training these neural networks and varying things like the, the echo times and the repetition times to get different contrasts. And then there's a series of data augmentations, such as changing the intensity levels, flipping the image, rotating the image, just to give that network more and more examples of what case space might look like truncated and then expanded so that it can really train um, a good uh, algorithm that's stable and robust and doesn't generate any artifacts. So this is the challenge in Air Recon DL to get from the image on the left to the image on the right. And the first thing this will do is reduce Gibbs ringing. So we don't have that abrupt transition anymore. It's, uh, it continues on further into case space, giving much sharper uh, images with less, um, less ringing. And then it also improves the resolution. So that's the first example of what ARDL can do. And we can measure the sharpness, which we'll define as the ability to transition between high and low signal intensities. And as I mentioned, it's, it's independent of the recon level. And mathematically, we can say that this is the maximum gradient uh, of our original image as it, as it falls off, divided by the maximum gradient of our ARDL image. And if we draw a line across a phantom uh, shown on the left, we'll get a, a graph here that shows the position, that the intensity on the vertical axis against the position on the horizontal axis. And those um, steep drops are where it goes from a high intensity to a low intensity. And as you, as you can see, there's some uh, gibbs in there as well. And if we look at the gradient, so the rate of change of signal with position, we see these spikes where the gradient's high because it's changing position, the intensity is changing with position very quickly. And the purple spikes in this case are our ARDL, and then the blue is our original image, but uh, it's difficult to see. And we can just measure the sharpness using this equation. And our finding is that clinically images are between 30 to 60% sharper and images with worse spatial re resolution um, benefit more from this algorithm. So if your initial image is very, very high quality and you just click the ARDL button, then it won't benefit very much in terms of a, a resolution boost. Whereas if you have a, a coarse matrix, um, such as you know, the low quality synthetic images that were used to train the network, then you'll get a, a big benefit in terms of um, resolution and, and Gibbs suppression. So this is a clinical example of a T2 FSE acquired without ARDL on the left. This was a two-year-old um, patient, and you can see a, a line profile through the, the midline showing in red the original signal across that line and in blue the recon DL. So we have a, a, an improvement in sharpness of around 30% in this case. One thing it won't do is improve motion artifact because that's due to a, a sampling problem where you're sampling different lines of case space and they're appearing in different positions as the patient moves um, over that time period. So if you see images like this, ARDL um, won't do anything to improve motion. And here's another example just showing that, that sharpness. If we take our conventional image on the left and we subtract our recon image, we can see the percentage change in color. And those kind of yellow blue lines that are squiggling through the image show uh, a suppression of Gibbs artifact between those boundaries and a sharpening up of the signal as you go from uh, gray matter to white matter in CSF. So there's another thing we can do with this uh, neural network approach, and that's to train with noise. So instead of synthesizing images at lower resolution, we might synthesize image by putting in Gaussian noise, uh, which is just the normal noise that you experience in the system at um, in, the, in the raw data. And then they can reconstruct the images as they would appear on the scanner and train the network. And here, instead of learning to uh, obtain a high resolution image, they're learning to um, remove that extra Gaussian noise. And in doing so, when we acquire noisy images, we can remove some of that noise that appears in the raw data using the same deep neural network approach. And just to, to show an example of the SNR at, at the original and then low, medium and high levels for a phantom, we can see uh, low has a small effect, a small SNR boost, 
and then medium is, is more, and then SNR is nearly double that. So the equivalent number of signal averages is shown on the right hand side of the graph. And we can see at high we have, it's effectively doing the same as a, a, a very large number of um, signal averages. And secondly, if we look at a, um, at a phantom that varies between sort of 5% and 100% proton density, so the intensities are, are increasing uh, across the phantom as we go as we go around from, from low intensity, so this is a very low SNR in part of the image, all the way up to a very high intensity um, part of the image that has very high SNR, we get this percentage SNR increase versus our proton density. And th there's an effective um, trailing off where parts of the image with uh, very high levels of noise are going to be, are going to benefit more from, from the benefits, from the SNR increase um, due to our ARDL versus um, images, parts of the image with very high SNR, they're not going to benefit as much in terms of denoising. So, uh, I think I've spoken about that. So, denoising, uh, an example from our lumbar spine, this is an axial T2. We can see the conventional image on the left is acquired with a, a relatively uh, coarse matrix, but the signal uh, just isn't, isn't quite enough. And then when we apply our ARDL, we can see much uh, better uniformity across the spinal processes and the vertebral body. And just to, to show that point again, if we do a subtraction, so our original image minus our ARDL image, we can see that the percentage change on the colour image is between, well, it's more than plus or minus 30% that noise. So we're removing well over 30% of the noise in the image. And where this will really have uh, greatest benefit for uh, clinical implementations is those areas of the image that are very low contrast. So there's a high amount of noise and you can barely make out the underlying um, tissue. And so here we can see the contrast to noise ratio on, this is a, a human um, challenge where uh, readers were asked to identify the presence or absence of a dot. And so these dots are at different contrast to noise ratios and the discs are at different diameters. And we can see that the humans, um, the humans rated the ARDL images on the right and the normal uh, original images on the left. And the improvement in detectability is shown here. So 0.5 is they were 50% more likely to detect um, a target than um, using the ARDL than in the original. And so here we can see there's, there's really a, a significant benefit just across these uh, last few targets kind of in this area here where the discs are a very low contrast to noise ratio. And so those are the parts of the image where the clinicians will see details they wouldn't otherwise have been able to spot without ARDL. And just to um, perhaps elucidate this example, if we take the noise um, profile from that previous image, we can convolve it into a normal image, and this would be our ARDL image, and then we get our, our conventional image, which has um, that, that noise in there. And we can see it doesn't really help identifying the um, high intensity signals such as the, the tower, but in those low contrast areas, which is these buildings back here, you can see a significant improvement when you denoise the image. And some clinical examples now, we have an oblique T2 fast spin echo. So these are 0 0.5, 0 0.5 by two mil slice thicknesses, uh, showing a, a small rectal tumor here. And there's much better contrast on the ARDL image. And here we can see a sagittal steady state FSE. And again, we can see a bulky rectal tumor with um, an extended, extensive nodal disease and vascular invasion. And we have better uh, delineation of the, the boundaries of this tumor and the, the vessels are easier to see. But overall, it's just a slightly crisper image with um, lower levels of noise. And here we've got an example of some diffusion images with and without the ARDL. So our original protocol um, had diffusion for this, this uh, liver at 4 minutes 15 seconds. So we can see here our necks of 4 and our necks of 7 at B50 and B600. And with ARDL we've been able to bring this down to a necks of 2 and a necks of 3 with ARDL on high. And the images um, are uh, very comparable in terms of the quality, the SNR and and um, they're slightly sharper as well, which is good. This is an example from um, our MR30 software. So we now have access to 
um, ARDL, not just on our Cartesian sequences. We also we can do it in, in 3D with the lava sequences. And this is a lava aspire showing uh, low, medium and high. And these are superb uh, image qualities. Um, so the aspire is an enigmatic chem uh, fat sat. Here we have uh, an example showing the standard coronal lava flex acquisitions pre ARDL. Um, and on the right now we have our coronal reformats using um, lava flex with ARDL on high. And so we can see the septations are much easier to identify and they're much crisper using this uh, technology. A dual spin echoes. So our original image has a, a six, six uh, skip 0.6 and we can see some truncation artifacts and some ringing uh, throughout the, the liver and the spleen. And here we've got some uh, truncation artifacts that makes um, sort of observations of, of the pathology in the spleen potentially more difficult for some of our clinicians. And with the ARDL, it's, uh, it's been removed, that ringing has been removed here. And we can see that there's no uh, line going across the spleen here at all. So we can also use ARDL to reduce acquisition time. So this is a meningioma um, at um, L4S1, so we can see here, uh, which was excised following uh, two courses of radiotherapy. And this, the original image was uh, 3 minutes 16. And then for the, the same uh, kind of quality, we can see here, in fact, slightly improved uh, levels of SNR in the, in the vertebral bodies and the discs and the scan time by reducing the number of necks is one minute and nine seconds. So the impact this has had on our service at Cambridge, um, we were part of a 12 week review prior to the release of 2D Air Recon DL in 2021, and more recently 3D Air Recon DL this year. Um, and I think overall we optimized our new protocols to improve resolution whilst somewhat reducing the scan time, as you can see in this table. We particularly wanted to reduce the scan time for things like breath holds, um, giving better support for patients with breathing difficulties and um, acquiring images with less motion in them for longer, that sometimes creeps in for longer breath holds. Um, overall, we've had fewer recalls as scans are of higher quality and exam durations are shorter, which means that there's less um, time for motion impact, motion artifacts to creep in towards the end of a, a, protocol, a long protocol. We've also benefited from the use of new air coils that's allowed great flexibility, easy lifting of those coils onto patients. And the service that we run uses four 1.5 Ts and two three Tesla scanners. And the aim um, recently of our upgrades have been to get all of our scanners onto the latest software. So previously that was DV29, and now that will be MR30, as those are the two software releases that allow um, users to have access to these um, AI accelerated techniques. So for protocol optimization, the requirements for the 2D uh, Air Recon DL is DV29 and for 3D uh, Recon DL is MR30. And there's different ways of optimizing. Sorry, there's a link to GE Cares just in below the video here. Um, but the, the options for optimizing are firstly to reduce scan time, and this is shown here. And then secondly is to um, improve the resolution. And then finally, it's a, there can be a balanced approach where we want to um, set aims for improving voxel size and scan time and try and balance those two by kind of blending the two before. But really, the findings are from our um, implementations is that you have to optimize for recon DL strength. And this is often a user choice. So how much uh, denoising do you want to see in your image? And then the matrix size, slice thickness, and then there's a a constraint on the bandwidth to echo train length, although this is perhaps less important. Next is very important. If you have high next, the first thing you want to do is, is to bring that down and save yourself some scan time. And then also we can push our can asset slightly further if we're using ARDL. So this is an example of a knee. Uh, these are um, axials that we've acquired on our 3T Premier Scanner using 18 channel um, transmit receive coil. And we've gone from next of uh, two to next of one. So the ARDL image is shown here on the left. And we can see it's a slightly smoother texture across the, across the bone. And there's a slightly higher contrast against, against the cartilage for a shorter scan time. What we've also been able to do with this protocol is to slightly increase our TR, getting better proton density um, weighting. 
but we've kept the echo train length um, the same across both images as we thought an echo train length of eight was uh, was long enough to reduce the 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 T2 effect of having a longer uh, echo time. So here we can see also on our images there is some uh, pulsatile motion artifacts that are slightly more visible on the ARDL image. This is potentially due to having an X of one instead of two. And again uh, using this on the sagittals we can see the same uh, implementation has been done. We've gone from around 250 seconds to 160. Uh, and this is the, the sagittal uh, PD FATSAT and we can see the motion artifact in our A ARDL is potentially more prominent and this is due to the denoising when you put ARDL on high. So it's not that the, uh, it's not that the, um, the artifact isn't, isn't there in the, uh, the, the higher um, in the original image, it's just potentially there's slightly more noise and so it's less prominent. And also going from an X of two uh, to an X of one means there's less opportunity for those um, flow artifacts to kind of average themselves out. And this is the, the final example. This is our sagittal PD and the ARDL image, which is acquired in 100 seconds versus 188 is shown on the left. And we can see a, a meniscal tear here. And I would say that the image on the left uh, has better contrast for that meniscal tear compared to the, the longer original image showing better contrast resolution. So these are some examples from our Signa artist at MR30. So we have our T2 propellers now. So ARDL allows for motion insensitive uh, recons. And so this is a T2 propeller in two minutes and 29 seconds and then our T1 propeller at three and a half minutes. And this is a paediatric patient and they were querying C8 uh, and T1 nerve uh, distribution paisley. Um, sorry, and there was a brachial plexus injury or, or was it nerve compression? And so again, using our cubes, we can acquire a hypercube stir uh, in four and a half minutes. So this is using around 20% um, compressed sensing on the images, which is about as far as we recommend going on our scanners to our to our clinicians our, our radiographers sorry and this is another example from our MR30 scanner so we have the ability to apply ARDL to multi-phase imaging so we can see the arterial the venous and the late phase for our MR contrast using a lava respire and then also our Dixon type images so our flex um, these are fast spin echo flexes I also have ARDL, so we can see our water imaging and our in-phase images. And here we can see just a 3D T2 fast spin echoes with ARDL, showing good um, delineation of this vertebral body shape for the clinicians to perform their report. So in the middle, we have a wrist with propeller um, imaging using ARDL, and on the left are ARDL PD FATSAT fast spin echoes. And these images are almost um, identical in terms of the voxel uh, sizes and the scan times are very similar. And with our propeller imaging, we can get very high quality images um, re with reducing the effects of patient voluntary motion and physi physiological motion, such as breathing, flow, peristalsis, uh, and also reducing susceptibility artifacts. And on the right, we can see our ganglion cyst uh, down here at the bottom. So propeller allows us to reduce motion and benefit uh, from ARDL on MR30. And finally, this is an example uh, not from Cambridge, but from GE, as I couldn't find uh, an example that we had in our own data set showing the effects of um, higher um, kind of uh, fiber tracking uh, abilities. So from uh, MR30, the diffusion tensor imaging um, can show clearly uh, longer fiber tracks using the ARDL images on the right compared to those on the left. And so this is something of interest potentially from uh, a neuro uh, point of view if you're doing any pre-surgical planning. The IPEM uh, task and finish group now have a web page that's gone live that's collated uh, user experience, including things like the uh, model and software info needed to run different ARDL products and other accelerated acquisition techniques. So here we can see an example that uh, for GE, so compressed sensing, and these are all for DV29. 
uh, DV, well, DV MR30 hasn't been evaluated yet, but I've included these here and hopefully they'll make it onto the web page um, shortly. So Hypersense is the compressed sensing uh, toolkit for GE. It's available on 3D sequences and there's a number of sequences that it includes. And it works well for sequences with really low information content, things like TOFs and um, uh, MRCP exams, where you can set the factors much higher. Whereas traditionally, uh, what we say for our users is to limit the use of compressed sensing to a maximum of, of 1.1 uh, or 1.2, so 10 or 20%. And there's a, a challenge that above 20%, you start to in introduce more blurring artifacts due to the use of compressed sensing, missing parts of, of that, that information in the image. And then for simultaneous multi-slice acquisitions, it's available from uh, 28 onwards, and its GE product name is Hyperband. It's available on EPI sequences, um, so T, T, 2D uh, diffusion weighted imaging gradient and gradient echoes. So this is good for, for the head uh, and it speeds up the DTI acquisitions, but the, the overall impact on clinical service is limited as it's not a whole body simultaneous multi-slice like for some of the other vendors. It's very much just for um, EPI imaging. And then finally, AI, I think I've spoke a bit about this already, but just to say that on MR30, these are some of the sequences that are available. So we've got our 3D cubes, which is really good, our fast spin echoes using the flex, and we have DTI, um, and then the T2 mapping uh, for kind of body imaging. So it's designed for cartilage, and then the cardiac uh, T1 uh, phase sensitive MDEs. So there's a delayed um, enhancement, de delayed myocardial enhancement imaging. And then finally, just behind the scenes, I think this saves us about 200 um, hours a year, although there's a caveat that this is running uh, a very large number of scanners or a relatively large number of scanners for a very long time. But the pre-scans are also compressed by about 20 to 30 percent, uh, allowing for slightly faster pre-scanning. So if you run that over, uh, sort of 40,000 patients, it will save you a bit of time. And AirX is another accelerated technique, potentially allowing the users to save some time in terms of setting up the scanner. So it segments the localizer and it can put the slices on automatically based on the coverage that, and the orientation that you need. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not foolproof. It's, it's pretty good in healthy volunteers. And then in patients with diseases like encephalitis or, or having any sort of implant, it will, or, or large tumours, it will struggle. Uh, so it's very much uh, a case that it doesn't replace the user, you know, still check slice positioning, but it's potentially very helpful for some diseases like MS, where, you, where the, it helps the slices line up between the different sequences so that lesions, individual lesions can be easily tracked over time. So to conclude, um, Air Recon DL has been the, the kind of the bulk of this talk. We've seen the effect it has on sharpness and on Gibbs suppression, suppression and that this is independent of DL le uh, recon levels. So even at the lowest level, you're benefiting substantially from a, an improvement in resolution and Gibbs suppression. And then we have the denoising at low, medium and high, and that's very much up to users to select the level that their radiologists uh, prefer. There's a protocol optimization that's available from GE that goes through the steps that you might want to follow to improve your image quality. And then uh, ARDL is available in two flavors, the 2D Cartesian version at DV29. And from MR30, we have an extension which includes 3D and propellers. And there's some resources on the IPEM webpage that will be kept live and updated as time goes by. And there's also some other uh, smaller advantages you can have from more bespoke accelerations like um, parallel, um, simultaneous multi-slice, and also this, this AirX and some compressed sensing as well. Okay. Um, so I think uh, I may have lost the, uh, the end of that uh, due to a, a network uh, glitch at my end, but uh, hopefully that all ran through properly for everybody else. Um, let me just see now if I can um, uh, share my screen. Hopefully uh, that's uh, working for everybody. Um, just wanted to 
Is that okay, James? Can you can you see that? Somebody could just talk to me. Yeah, that's that's working. Just updates, okay. Um, so just a, a couple of updates. Uh, number one, um, <clears throat> I was asked just to correct um, uh, what Ed had put at the end there. The uh, the the a IPEM website at the moment is only live for IPEM members, um, but I know. Um, the team are certainly working to make sure that that's available to uh, uh, to non-members as well. So just a little bit of an update. Uh, it is live, but only for IPEM members, um, but it will be uh, uh, expanded to uh, other groups who aren't members of IPEM later on. Um, I thought it was also interesting that uh, this uh, document recently came out uh, from the MHRA uh, guidance on um, reporting adverse incidents involving software as a medical device. Um, and under the examples of types of adverse incidents that may be reportable, um, the uh, MHRA have now included uh, accelerated MRI software that degrades the appearance of anatomical and pathological structures, leading to an incorrect, delayed or missed diagnosis. Uh, so if people hadn't come across that, just a um, Google for that uh, fairly recent MHRA guidance. Uh, and then finally, it's just going to show you um, something that uh, GE released at uh, this year's ISMRM uh, last week. Uh, this is uh, Sonic DL. Um, and now this is a way of actually acquiring data in a single heartbeat. So um, I will just start off. So this is essentially a multi phase. Uh, acquisition, but uh, they're using um, subsampling in the same way that we have with uh, compressed sensing, um, but then putting through this through a modification of the air recon DL uh, algorithm, which they're calling Sonic DL. So this is a multi slice cine, but each cine slice is acquired in a single heartbeat. Um, and then the entire stack of slices. Uh, is obtained in a single breath hold. So this is using 12-fold acceleration uh, with Poisson disk sampling. Um, so that's all I wanted to do on that. Um, and now I can stop sharing. And uh, I'm happy to take any other questions. Um, I've seen that people have very kindly put, uh, uh, put uh, some questions in already, and hopefully I've answered those. Uh, if not, um, so Rosa asks, uh, have you evaluated the degree of blurring introduced by the AI denoising recon for the speed up of protocols? Um, I mean, on, on the question of, um, of blurring, um, what our experiments have shown is that um, the, the part of the air recon DL algorithm is that GE have actually um, dispensed with the case space appetization filter. So if you turn off the, uh, uh, the Fermi filter that, um, that GE happened to use on their case space data, um, then you will get very similar resolution um, to what you would get with, um, with the Air Recon DL. So, and that's better than what you obviously get with the standard reconstruction. So I think a lot of the, uh, the resolution enhancements simply come because they've got rid of that uh, apodization filter. If you get rid of the filter, then it increases the, uh, the ringing in the image. That's why, you know, apodization filters are normally used. Um, but then the Air Recon DL helps with suppressing the ringing artifacts. So it's almost like getting back to what the original data should be. Um, so if we are speeding up the protocols, um, essentially any of the speed ups that we're doing is by virtue of reducing the, um, uh, the uh, essentially the, um, uh, the number of phase encode lines. So you're almost getting um, what, true spatial resolution you would expect without the additional um, blurring that comes in through use of the uh, the Fermi filter, uh, if that answers it. So at the moment, everything that Ed showed you is fully sampled case space. 
So make it clear that um, the current implementation of Air Right Recon DL works on fully sampled case space. So there's no um, intrinsic acceleration uh, that you're getting there, other than the fact that you could obviously cut the number of signal averages. Now, the Sonic DL is the next step for GE, which is indeed now where they are actually subsampling and not um, using um, uh, and using the Air Recon DL algorithm almost as a, a, a method of bypassing or acting as a surrogate for the, uh, the ARC type re reconstruction that the, uh, that the scanner does. So at the moment, all the acceleration, uh, if you want to talk about acceleration, simply comes through reducing the number of signal averages, um, you know, going to um, 0.5 next, but obviously uh, not having such a large effect on, or such a big hit on the SNR. Um, but it's not until we move to um, uh, MR 30.1 that I understand. Uh, and again, only at the moment is that simple, that single CINE cardiac examination is where they're starting to do the undersampling. Um, okay, uh, hopefully that's, uh, so maybe I'll just um, pick up David's Thomas's question next. The MHRA point you mentioned sounded to me like it was warning against using excessively high parallel imaging factors rather than DL. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, that can be uh, included in there as well. I mean, um, there's obviously a lot more concern about um, the potential for hallucinations, for, for want of a better word, and, you know, uh, pathology mimicking artifacts appearing with the deep learning algorithms than they necessarily are with high parallel imaging factors. Um, so I would think that potentially that's because it's a relatively recent uh, document from the MHRA is that it's probably more to do with um, them thinking that there might potentially be these kind of uh, hallucinations coming from the DL rather than necessarily excessively high parallel imaging factors, where I guess we are more radiologists should be more familiar with the kind of artifacts that they see. Um, so I think that's it, but I think, you know, a, a general warning against, you know, excessively high parallel imaging factors is, is good. And, um, that's probably something that we need to be very careful of, uh, particularly in compressed sensing, uh, where, you know, there is the possibility there that, um, uh, you know, small perturbations in the original data may end up, you know, making potential artifacts. I've not, I've not seen any such as that. I've seen papers that have talked a lot about um, artifacts associated with um, compressed sensing, um, and they tend to be discussed in terms of sort of more uh, streaking or line streaking artifacts. I've seen mention of things like um, waxy film. Um, uh, um, presentations, um, but nothing that um, has actually led to artifacts or or potentially pathology pathological mimicking artifacts. Uh, they've been more, uh, you know, art, more of our classic kind of uh, artifacts that we see in MR with, um, you, you know, levels of uh, of, of noise or. Um, or these kind of streaking artifacts. I think another one was a starry skies artifact. There was a recent um, uh, insights in imaging, I think, publication that um, that looked at those artifacts. Uh, right. Um, hopefully that's answered that question. Um, anonymous attendee, do I understand correctly? Does AI recon fill up the missing case space data based on the training? training data when it's used in acceleration mode. No, as I say, um, Air Recon DL is not, um, does not itself use any subsampling. Sonic DL, which I just showed you, is the technique that uses uh, subsampling and then a deep learning reconstruction algorithm. Uh, the moment Air Recon DL 
takes fully sampled case space and gives you an improved SNR image, whether that's in 2D or 3D. So from some of the examples that Ed showed you, you know, we would never really have considered doing a two millimeter thick single shot fast spin echo in the body. Um, but now the liver guys are very happy to uh, to look at those images because um, you know they've got uh, the desired SNR uh, plus the fact that the absence of this filter has also meant that now they've got uh, you know this improvement in spatial resolution which also then helps them to you know consider whether or not tumors are actually invo you know, invading muscle uh, and stuff like that so um, hopefully that's uh, that answers that question, but say it's certainly not at the moment filling in any missing case space data. It's standard um, acquisitions, but denoised and uh, uh, you know de Gibbs artifacted uh, reconstruction. Okay. Any other questions that I've not answered? We give we've got um, five more minutes. I'm happy to uh, hang on here uh, if people uh, are thinking about uh, potential questions. Uh, I assume everybody is muted and uh, we can't actually have a, a discussion or a chat. Is that possible, James? Uh, yes. Yeah, so everybody is on mute. But if if anyone wants to ask a question in person, they can. Um put the hand up and we can invite them to speak. Okay, so William said, re new case space lines synthesized outside the acquired case space region. That was the impression I had from the presentation. Um, okay, uh, that hopefully shouldn't have been the impression that you had. Uh, there is, um, I think maybe just in the training algorithms there, there was the fact that uh, GE take high resolution data uh, and then they have been taking that data and then um, you know discarding case based lines and creating lower resolution um, data with increased Gibbs artifact as you would imagine if you had a 512 by 512 data and you subsampled that just to take the uh, the inner 128 by 128 you'd get the low resolution data so that essentially has been the um, the data that's been trained on. Um, so they've not taken separate sets of data. And uh, at the moment, there's no synthesization of data at all in the current Air Recon DL. Sonic DL, absolutely. Um, it's essentially, you know, performing that, what would have been a compressed sensing reconstruction, but by using that as some variant of the Air Recon DL. Uh, of course, Air, um, uh, Air Recon DL does work in combination with compressed sensing and parallel imaging. Uh, so Maria has gone to the webinar chat. Um, have you seen any cases where pathology disappeared due to the use of Air Recon DL? Uh, categorically, no. Um, we did start originally by reconstructing both the standard recon images and the uh, air recon dl images um, in the latest software release that's not it can be turned on that capability but by default uh, ge haven't done that um, just because of you know essentially doubling the amount of information that you go to pax um, but certainly no radiologist has yet expressed any concern that they feel they're they're missing anything. In fact, to the contrary, um, while I wouldn't say they're seeing things they've never seen before, uh, they're say certainly um, impressed with the spatial resolution and the contrast to noise that they get for subtle pathologies. Um, so I think, yeah, it's uh, it's really been a win-win a situation and we have yet, well, be very hard to know whether now we only reconstruct Air Recon DL images with the appropriate level for the particular uh, area of anatomy, whether or not we're missing anything. But I, uh, I think from our very extensive original evaluation, we're pretty confident that, that we're not missing anything. 
And they're the guys who are going to be up in court when they do. Okay, two more minutes by my iPhone. Anything else I can try and answer for you? Okay, um, if not, uh, if I do go back to um, sharing my screen. Then hopefully it's the right one. Uh, thank you very much indeed um, for attending this, uh, this webinar. Um, please, you know, continue to post questions to the uh, uh, the uh, the working party on the uh, on the task force and you know I think by working together we can all gain a good understanding of what these sequences do or these reconstruction methods do under the hood. Uh, and just to tell you, uh, next Friday, twenty third of June at twelve thirty, um, we're going to have a presentation on Siemens uh, techniques. And Friday, the thirtieth of June. Uh, then we will uh, have a presentation on the Phillips methods. Uh, so with that, thank you very much uh, and have a very nice weekend. Goodbye.